بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا حيا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهد الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والشهداء والصالحين وعترة نبيك الطاهرين قال تعالى في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واستعينوا بالصبر والصلاة وإنها لكبيرة إلا على الخاشعين صدق الله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'd like to talk about the power of perseverance. And I want to share with you a quote I came across recently. This was written in 1937 by an author who had interviewed some of the most successful people in the United States up until that point. And he said the following. He said, the religious leader of the future will be forced to give more attention to the temporal needs of his followers. The word, the word temporal refers to earthly matters. So in the context of uh, Islam, in our language, we would refer to that as the dunya or something that is dunyawi. We'll be forced to give more attention to the temporal needs of his followers in contrast of uh, other needs. In the solution of their economic and personal problems, of the present and less attention to the dead past and yet unborn future. And I want to share that with you because uh, as we've been discussing the power of optimism and the power of hope and this week the power of perseverance, this is the message that I'd like to get across is that what, what people truly, in, in my humble opinion, need from our leaders, our religious leaders, our political leaders, our leaders in different arenas, is an understanding of how to solve our personal problems, how to solve our economic problems. The world today, the outside world is in turmoil. People, many people have lost their sense of hope. Uh, they are uncertain, they are unsure of what is going to happen in the future, what's happening right now. How much control do we have over what's going on? And so when I share these topics, I do so with the intention of hopefully shedding some light and bringing back hope and optimism and belief in our presence. So I just wanted to share that with you. And, and, and like I said today, I want to talk about the power of perseverance. For those of you who've been tuning in, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about the power of optimism. And last week, we spoke about the power of hope. So taking it one step further is perseverance. Now, what is perseverance? What is the definition of perseverance? It is the steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose, a state, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. That is perseverance, and in the Arabic language, the word for that is muthabara. On the other hand, you have forbearance, which is hilm. And so what is the definition of forbearance? It is forbearing conduct or quality, patient endurance, and self-control. The link between forbearance and perseverance is endurance, which is what we call tahammul or sumud. So I want to talk a little bit about these terms because sometimes they're used interchangeably 
and specifically the term hilm, which refers to forbearance. Now, the way that we understand hilm is that it is an enduring form of patience. So, sort of like a patience 2.0, if you will. And there was a scholar who uh, lived from 1914 to 1993 in academic circles. He is considered uh, a foremost scholar on the Quran, Japanese born. His name was Toshihiko Izutsu. And he wrote a number of books, different languages. Uh, he was a man who spoke fluently many languages, uh, including Arabic and Persian. In fact, he studied in Japan, he studied in Iran, and then he went on to teach at McGill University in Canada. And his translation of the Quran from Japanese to English is considered one of the most, uh, I'm sorry, from Arabic to Japanese, excuse me, is considered one of the most uh, linguistically sound translations out there. He wrote a number of books. One of them is uh, Ethno-Religious Concepts in the Quran. Another one is Man in the Quran. And this is what he has to say when it comes to the topic of Hilm, forbearance in the Quran. The way that he saw it was that Hilm, forbearance, was the true opposite of Jahl. Now when we say Jahl or Jahiliyyah, and I've mentioned this a number of times before. Uh, how do we perceive jahiliyyah? How do we translate that? Most people translate it as ignorance. Now, contextually, it does refer to ignorance. However, what he says here is that in the language of the Quran, jahil is not to be translated as ignorance. Jahil is to be rabid and confrontational. So the opposite of jahl is not ilm, which is knowledge. The opposite of jahl is hilm, which is forbearance. It's not ilm, but rather hilm. Because the true meaning of jahl is not ignorance. If it was, the opposite would be ilm, which is knowledge and enlightenment. The true meaning of jahl is being rabid and confrontational, you know, being able to get in somebody's face. The opposite of that is holding back, forbearance, which is hilm. So um, that's something that, that, that I wanted to, to share with you. But those terms, forbearance, perseverance, endurance, they're all sort of used interchangeably with one another. But today I want to talk about the power of perseverance, which is a steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose, a state, especially in spite of difficulty. So the character, the characteristic of being resilient. I want to share with you a tradition and a, a narration I came across recently from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says the following. He says, إِذَا هِبْتَ أَمْرًا فَقَعْ فِيهِ فَإِنَّ شِدَّةَ تَوَقِّيهِ أَعْظَمُ مِمَّا تَخَافُ مِنْهِ and last week we spoke about dealing with fear and emotional intelligence. What Imam Ali salam describes here is the height of emotional intelligence. Basically what he says is that if you fear something, if there's something that you fear, whether it's talking to a stranger, whether it's starting a project, whether it's learning a language, whatever it is that you are fearful of, public speaking as we mentioned last week. Whenever you fear something, he says, fall into it, lean into it, move forward despite your fear. Why? He says, because the fear of anticipation is often greater than the thing itself. And if you've ever conquered a fear, whether it was, you know, climbing up uh, a ladder or speaking to somebody or public speaking, whatever it is, the first time you did it, you realize that the anticipation that you built up on the front end was actually worse than the thing itself. And so what he's talking about here is that whenever we fear something, our mind interprets it as something greater 
than it actually is. And if you look at how the mind works, that's exactly how the mind works actually biologically. Imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam is, is, is describing 1400 years ago what psychologists have only recently learned about how the mind works. You know, when you look at the mind, when you look at the brain, I should say, biologically, the part that is responsible for fear is a small portion called the amygdala. And the amygdala is part of the center of the brain. It's about the size of uh, a walnut or an almond. And many animals, mammals and other animals, they share this part of the brain with human beings. That's why animals also uh, can be fearful of a situation as well. Now, fear comes from that center, but the way that fear is interpreted is by the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Now, don't lose me here. I'm trying to make a point. You know, this, these words, sometimes people get lost in these words. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes what we fear is not actually scary or dangerous or threatening in itself. But the way our brain responds to it, the way our brain interprets it is fall back. And so in the subject of emotional intelligence, we learn that some things that we actually fear, you've got to lean into in order to realize that it's not really a threat. Now, why are our brains wired that way? Well, it serves a purpose. Fear actually serves a purpose. During the days where people lived out in the wilderness, there had to be some sort of mechanism which gave you a signal that when you saw a threat, when you saw a rattlesnake or a bear or an invading tribe, there had to be some sort of signal which went off in your brain which told you to be cautious and to protect yourself. The problem that some psychologists and authors talk about is that our brain, the part that interprets fear, hasn't really evolved so much. And so the things that we think are scary, you know, people will look at public speaking or trying something new for the first time and in their mind it's like they're seeing a big bear in front of them or a rattlesnake. When in reality, there's no real threat that can really hurt them in any way. So what Imam Ali is saying is that when you fear something, lean into it, fall into it. Because that anticipation that builds up is actually worse than the thing that you're fearing. I heard a story one time and uh, it was a gentleman who had uh, served in the military and he was talking about how he was trained to uh, fly helicopters. And during the course of training, he was told that there was, there was a little gauge, I'm not sure what it's called, but he said that we were trained uh, and we were taught that when that gauge goes off, that means your helicopter is going to fall. It's going to crash. Now, sitting there in the, in the cockpit, sitting in the pilot seat, he's got the little, I don't know what they call it, the lever, the stick in front of him. He's able to control whether the helicopter goes forward, leans forward, or it leans back. Now, he says that when the helicopter begins to lose altitude, as a pilot, what your mind tells you to do is to pull back. Because you, you want to pull back, you don't want to fall. He says, but if you actually do that, the, pr the, the, the helicopter, what he learned in, in training, is that the helicopter falls quicker because it leans back like this. He says, what we were taught to do in pilot school was that you actually have to lean it forward because if you lean the helicopter forward, it actually picks up speed and you have a greater chance of survival. He said, that's what we were taught. But when you're in the middle of war, when you're in the middle of battle, guns are shooting at you, rockets, all that stuff, and you're in enemy territory, that's the last thing that your brain is thinking about. He said, but that's exactly what happened when he was in battle and, and he fought in, in Vietnam. He said, that gauge went off and all of a sudden, I felt the helicopter started to fall. He said, instead of pulling back, which is what my mind was screaming at me to do, 
He said, I pushed forward. That's the last thing that you want to do is push forward. He said, but I pushed forward. It was the thing that I was fearful of, but I leaned into that fear. And that's how he was able to survive. So there are some situations that we come across in life, especially when the world, when the media around us is perpetuating fear at us, is perpetuating panic. You have to be able to take hold of your emotions. And that's the topic of emotional intelligence. And you have to be able to move forward despite the difficulties. That is the meaning of perseverance. That's the power of perseverance. And so when, when, you, when you do overcome that fear, you experience what is called mastery. If you remember last week, we spoke about cognitive behavioral therapy and self-talk and how if you learn to change your words and you describe your situation, it starts with your words that how do you describe yourself when you're moving through adversity? How do you describe yourself when you feel hopeless? How do you describe yourself when you're not feeling so optimistic, when you don't believe in yourself, when you don't believe in the future? Well, the number one way is to change your words because our words, they don't only describe our reality, they create our reality. Well, to the tail end of that is, is uh, and, and we mentioned some of the research that was, that was done, and what the researchers went on to say is that what happens in our brain, remember we spoke about the plasticity in, in circuitry, how our brain, it actually learns to overcome. One of the ways that we experience that change in the circuitry of our brain that allows us to become more hopeful, that allows us to plow through those challenges, is when we are able to attain mastery during adversity. What does that mean? That means that as you experience pressure in your life, if you're able to master it, your brain actually changes. And what happens is that your brain begins to send you signals that the same way, the same way that I took care of myself or I was taken care of or the same way that I succeeded in the past, I can, see it in, I can succeed in the present and in the future. Whenever you're going through challenges, remind yourself, if you've, if you've been through challenges before and succeeded, whenever you go through challenges, remind yourself that I've been through challenges before, I've succeeded before. And that helps you begin to push through that paper wall. Let me share with you a, uh, a sermon. It's a very short sermon by Imam Ali alayhi salam, but it's about attaining mastery through adversity. It's about standing your ground and it's about perseverance. And this is sermon number 11. This took place during the Battle of Jamal, the first of three consecutive civil wars that happened during the rule of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And this is something that he said to his son, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya. He talks about grit. He talks about standing your ground. He talks about persevering despite the difficulties. He says the following, he says, Mountains may move from their position, but you should not move from yours. Grit your teeth, lend to Allah your head, meaning give yourself to God. Plant your feet firmly on the ground. Have your eye on the farthest enemy and close your eyes, meaning that don't pay attention to their numerical majority. Don't look at how much more they are in, you know, in, in, in weapons and, and people. And keep sure that victory is from Allah, the glorified. So here Imam Ali salam is telling us, again reinforcing that whole uh, narrative that even if you're afraid because you see numbers in front of you, sometimes when we go up against a fearful situation, I know sometimes when I, when I speak to uh, students, people who are applying to get into a, a certain program, whether it be a graduate program or not, or if you're speaking to students who are exiting out of a graduate program or, and are now looking for work, and they'll think, you know, I'm applying to a, a position where there's 100 other applicants, 150 other applicants, 200 other, other applicants. How the heck am I gonna get this position? Imam Ali says, close your eyes. 
forget about the numerical majority. And be sure that victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If God wants you to be victorious, there is nothing that's going to stand in front of you and block your way. Because that is God's decision. Now part of that, and I mentioned mastery through adversity, is that we actually have to experience adversity. What does that mean? That means that as parents and as leaders, sometimes we have the tendency of removing all difficult situations from our children. And that's an emotional need. As a parent, you don't want your child to be hurt in the same way that you were hurt when you were growing up. But that's not the most efficient way. That's not the most effective way of building perseverance. If you've studied different parenting styles, um, you know, there's the commando parent that runs the home like a staff sergeant in the military. There's the um, there's the dropout parent, the parent that kind of just gives up after a while. There's the groupie parents, they want to be their child's best friend and whatever uh, habit or whatever their child is doing, they want to sit there and, and they want to root them on. If you've heard of helicopter parents, they're, they're the type of parents that hover over their children and make sure that every decision that they make is in alignment with what they want for themselves. And then there's lawnmower parents. If you've seen a lawnmower, what does it do? It clears the path. And sometimes parents have very great intentions. This is not, I'm not talking about sinister intentions. I'm talking about great intentions that parents have. They want to remove every single adversity from the path of their child. And so their children get to age 18 or 20 or 21 and all of a sudden they're in university. They're 3,000 miles away and they get their first F on an exam. And because they've, they've never had to endure anything, they become fragile and they break down. This actually happens. So it's okay for us to experience adversity, but as long as we learn how to master our emotions and move through, that's how we build perseverance. That's how we build strength and endurance. Now the Quran tells us about having endurance and there's a practical way to do that. Chapter number 2 verse 45 says the following, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ Seek God's help with patient perseverance and prayer. It is indeed hard except for those who are humble. Meaning that those who are, are bigoted, those who think that they're in control of everything, those who are in a rush and they are hasty and they don't have perseverance and patience, it is hard upon them to do that, to seek God's help with patient perseverance and prayer. In another verse, this is chapter 2 verse 153, O oh you who believe, seek help with patient perseverance and prayer, for God is with those who patiently persevere. That's the power of perseverance. And to wrap this up, I just want to share with you how do we build perseverance? So the Quran tells us through patient perseverance and prayer, how do we build perseverance? Well, one way that we build perseverance is through awareness. See, when you're up against that thing that you fear, that you're worrying, when you know that it's not actually a brick wall, when you know that it's a paper wall, Imagine you had a wall in front of you, a barrier. You would treat it differently if it was a brick wall than if it was a paper wall. A paper wall you can just push through and poke and it would tear. It would offer no resistance. Versus a brick wall, you know, you, you probably break your shoulder if you try to ra run into it. But so many of the brick walls that we find in our lives, my friends, they're actually paper walls. And as soon as you push it, it tears through. That's what we call awareness. That's what we call self-awareness. So raising awareness is one way to build perseverance. I want to share with you five levels of awareness. And this is something that I came across recently. Some of you are probably uh, familiar with this concept. So stage one of awareness is called unconscious, uh, unconscious incompetence. What does that mean? We don't know what we don't know, right? 
It's also called uninformed optimism. When you try to start something in the beginning, a big project, whether it's learning a new language, a new degree, a new career, starting a new business, talking to somebody, public speaking, whatever those things that people fear for the first time, getting married, seeing grown men tremble in their boots at the prospect of, of being married, right? You have what is called unconscious incompetence. You, you basically, it's an uninformed optimism. It's, it's you don't know what you don't know. And some people say ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is the worst kind of poverty. Stop saying that it's bliss. Ignorance is poverty. You don't know what you don't know. So this is, this is level one. And sometimes you could be really excited when you don't know what you don't know. Number two, the second level of awareness is called conscious incompetence. So the first one was unconscious incompetence. The second is conscious incompetence. Now you know that you don't know. Maybe you started to engage. Maybe it's a fitness goal that you had. Uh, maybe you, you thought that you were going to be in the best shape of your life within three months. And then you went, you lifted weights, and you're sore for the next three days and you can't do anything. This is where most people give up, is when they develop conscious incompetence, when they know that they are incompetent and they need to get better and they need to have a longer term vision than what they have right now. It's called informed pessimism or being in the valley of despair. It's a wake up call. This is where fear begins to build and most people give up. Level number three is called conscious competence. If you're able to push through and develop your skill set and develop your patience and develop your endurance, you reach conscious competence. So that means that you become competent. You start to get better, right? Your confidence grows as your skill grows. You start to say, oh, you know what? I won before. I pushed through before. I can push through again. I can win again. That's level three. Level four is what we call unconscious competence. You're good at what you do, but you don't really have to overthink it anymore. So if you're a seasoned public speaker, for instance, you know, you've, you, you, you've done it for many years, you can now talk about whatever, whenever almost. You don't really have to overthink it. And then level number five is unconscious, conscious competence, aka mastery. You start to master everything that's in front of you. So whether the economy changes or it doesn't change, whether the job situation changes or it doesn't change, you have developed a skill set. You have developed enough awareness, enough perseverance, enough endurance, enough forbearance that whatever comes your way, you are confident. You know that you are going to overcome. This is a level that we call mastery. And when you study the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam, you realize that he was a master of his emotions. He was a master of everything that happened in front of him. Why? Because he placed his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew that God was the source of all victory, the source of everything good. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these times, during these challenging times, some of these uncertain times, to instill us with a sense of mastery to increase our self-awareness, to increase our emotional intelligence. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to realize that all good is from Him. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-asri inna al-insana lafi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.